30 years ago, angered by the fact that no woman had been elected to the Senate in her own right, Ellen founded a groundbreaking organization to help raise money to support women political candidates. Emily's List, which stands for Early Money is Like Yeast. <laughs> it, makes the, it makes the dough rise. <laughs> has since grown into a three million member community and has helped elect 19 women to the US Senate and 110 to the US House of Representatives. The organization continues to train women to run for state and local office as well. Ms. Malcolm has also had a robust career in civil service, including serving at the White House under President Jimmy Carter and as a co-chair of Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign. In her new book, When Women Win, Emily's List and the Rise of Women in American Politics, she shares the inside story of the rise of American women in elected office. Famed women's rights activist Gloria Steinem Praises women, praises, women had to first fight first for the vote and then for the right to be voted for. No one has been more crucial to this ongoing struggle than Ellen Malcolm, and no one has more revealing stories to tell, her own plus those of women candidates in all our diversity. When women win will give you faith that this country might one day become a democracy. Her talk tonight will be in conversation with Tamala Edwards, the anchor of 6 ABC Action News Morning Edition. We are so pleased to have him here with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Alan, Ellen Malcolm and Tamala Edwards to the Free Library. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming out this evening. It is an honor to sit here with Ellen Malcolm. I truly enjoyed the book and I told her we were going to start with her laying out the landscape. 1985 doesn't sound that long ago when Emily's list was put together. Not when you're my age, it was just a few <laughs> minutes ago. <laughs> but when she lays out the landscape of what it meant for female candidates, what it meant for female donors, it was a very different world. So let's start there. When you start thinking about this, what were women facing, both in terms of giving and in terms of running? It was a grim world out there for women. Um, we had basically gotten nowhere in electing women to top offices. Uh, in, in 1972, at the beginning of the women's movement, there were 14 Democratic women in the House. We started doing House races in 88. The 14 had actually gone down to 12. So 15 years of the women's movement, we lost two seats. We uh, had never elected a woman governor of a large state. Uh, and what absolutely enraged me and my friends was we had never elected a Democratic woman to the United States Senate in her own right in the history of this country. I mean, just think about that. There were a couple of Democratic women that had been in the Senate, but they were always appointed or their husband had died and they'd taken over his seat. And, uh, but there had never been a Democratic woman that had served in office and worked her way up the ladder and you know ran for the Senate in the usual way and won. And so uh, that really propelled me and my friends to do something a little different and uh, figure out a way that we could get some women in. But you also talk about women giving, that you would ask a woman to give money, and over a small amount of money she'd say, let me ask my husband. Well, there was some of that. There was, besides no women in office, there were very few women political donors at that time. Uh, Barbara Mikulski, uh, who was our first candidate, used to say, I couldn't raise money at all for my campaigns. I'd have barbecue for Barb, bowling for Barb, baseball for Barb, you know, anything. She'd speak at a crowd like this, she'd pass the hat. People would put in five or ten dollars. So women weren't used to writing checks. They weren't used to, as I used to say, adding the zeros to the checks. And one of the things Emily's List has done over the years is uh, explained politics and the process to our members and kind of held their hands and walked them through the process and encouraged them to give more money to campaigns. And so the world that you see today is far different and it's because a lot of women learned that it was okay to write checks to candidates just like it is to charity, to take charge of their own resources, they don't have to ask their husbands, uh, and it's made a huge historic difference. So 
for me, the book, in many ways, is a thank you to the members of Emily's List, who really are the ones that made history happen uh, by supporting women running across the country. Candidates will often say, no matter what you say, you have to ask at the end, I'm asking for your vote, or it doesn't matter. There's a point in the book where you go to ask a group of siblings, women, for big money, and you're nervous, like, will they give me $50,000 each? Nobody had ever asked them. Right. And that was shocking that if they had just asked. Well, it's also one of those great, there's another saw in, po in fundraising that you get what you ask for. And uh, we had started Emily's List. Well, let me explain kind of the essence of Emily's List and the donor network, what we did that was so different. Um, one of the reasons that we thought women weren't getting anywhere was because the old boys network didn't believe they could win and therefore wouldn't give them any money. And because they couldn't get any money from the traditional funders, obviously women couldn't win. So they were trapped in this vicious circle. So we needed to raise early money to give them credibility. But we also thought if we do it the way everybody else does it, which is to have a PAC, a political action committee, uh, we can only give legally up to $5,000 per election. That's not going to give our women credibility, so that isn't going to work uh, strategically. And anyway, we know women around the country that really care about women, and if we told them about our candidates, they would write checks to them. So why don't we raise money for the women as opposed to contribute it from Emily's list? So the essence of Emily's list, and what I would say in the beginning, remember there are no big women donors, I would go and say, we ask you to be a member of Emily's List and write a $100 check for your membership, and that'll take you through the two-year election cycle. Then we're kind of like your political staff. Our job is to find for you pro-choice Democratic women who have a realistic chance of winning races. In 1986, winning a Senate campaign. We'll send you information about the candidates. You'll learn all about them. You'll see what you'll hear what they've done in their lives, what the uh, opponent, who the opponent is, what the, uh, ha is happening in the race, uh, what the candidate's positions are on all kinds of issues, and then you, the member, decide what you want to do and make out your check to whoever you want. We hope during the two-year cycle you write $100 checks to two or three candidates we recommend. So if we have 1,000 people and they write a $100 check made out, Mikulski for Senate, we can raise $100,000 as opposed to the five or 10 we could contribute as a PAC. So it was a way of incredibly leveraging the amount of money for our women campaigns. At the same time, giving incredible uh, power and decision-making authority to the members. And so uh, we, we, right off the bat, people, even before we started helping the candidates, and I would tell that, people would cheer at the prospect of raising $100,000 for a Senate candidate. Women had never had that happen in their political lives. And yet it was so simple, it was so logical. We could do that, that you know, how hard could that be? And so uh, the donor network, Emily's List, changed politics and essentially reinvented political fundraising. Do you guys know who Emily is? Do you know what Emily stands for? Okay, so then I I don't believe it. Let me see. Early money <laughs> is like yeast. Yes. That's very good. Okay. So you, there, are, there are three tent poles, I would say, in the book about stories that tell you a little bit about the change in the demographic for women. You talked about Barbara Mikulski getting that money in early. Mm -hmm. She becomes the first elected in her own right. Oh, you it wasn't that simple, Tam. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell the story? You tell the story. Because, I mean, it, it was a phenomenal story because it was like a case study for what we were so angry about, which is that the old boys never believed women could win. So Barbara's in, in, first of all, Maryland is a very democratic state, but was particularly in 1986. So winning the primary was the key to the whole game. It was very unlikely that the nominee would lose the general election. So Barbara is a 10-year member of Congress. She comes from Baltimore. She grew up there. 
Uh, she is, uh, well, I, I don't know what your image of a United States senator is, but to me it's sort of six feet tall, silver hair, you know, chiseled jaw, you know. Barbara's 4'10". <laughs> she has a little bit of a weight issue. Um, her hair's a little out of whack a lot of the time. And uh, she said, they made me dress up for my debates. Um, they told me I had to wear these shoes, these Figaramos. She'd say, she say uh, I thought it was a restaurant in downtown Baltimore, you know. But she was a social worker who had stopped, organized the uh, community to stop a highway that was going to go right through uh, these wonderful ethnic old communities in Baltimore. And so she was beloved. She ran for city council, then went to Congress, had this incredible following in, the, in uh, Baltimore. Baltimore happens to be the media center and the democratic center uh, of Maryland. Also in the race was the governor, and he was having trouble with the savings and loan scandal, so he actually wasn't as much of a factor. But the other person in the race was a member of Congress from Montgomery County, Maryland not Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, but the same profile. It was the wealthy county right outside of Washington. And um, so he was considered the real challenge. So the polls come out and Barbara's ahead. Baltimore Sun Paul has her ahead 20 points way early in the race. She goes to the guy, she said, well, look at my poll, I'm in the Congress 10 years. Will you give me money? And they'd say, no, 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 it's just name recognition. You're not really going to win. Mike Barnes is going to raise all kinds of money. He's going to blow you out of the water. And no, it's not going to work. So the Mikulski campaign, now being in the same position, not able to raise money, said, uh, the campaign manager said, we've got to do everything we can to raise money to show that we can be financially competitive with Mike Barnes. And they called me up, and little old Emily's List, you know, this brand new and I'm really nervous and I've been trying to sign up members and we're kind of growing, they're like the little engine that could, you know. And so we sent out our first candidate mailing. And in three weeks, we raised t over $23,000 for her. So we realized that this donor network thing actually worked and that people wrote out checks to Mikulski for Senate. When, by the time the public federal elections report came out, uh, Barbara had raised more money than Mike Barnes and $60,000 of it came from little old Emily's List members. So uh, she is financially competitive. Mike Barnes, this is the way it works in politics. Mike Barnes's money dried up. Oh my God, she's got this big lead in the polls and now we see she can raise money, who knew? Um, so she's certainly going to run away with it. We better get on board with her. She's going to be the winner. His money dried up. She won the uh, nomination handily and went on to make history as the first Democratic woman ever elected to the Senate in her own right. The next tent poll story I thought was about Ann Richards, who mm. became... Love. I'm from Texas. I remember meeting her when she was the treasurer. She becomes the governor of the state. It is not easy, and we see the way that you have to turn around a negative race. She's fighting both the men in the party who say, wait, you've got to have us on board, and also the mud, the secret things they will say about women. Right. What did you learn out of that race? I learned that Ann Richards is as tough as anyone I've ever met in my life. <laughs> well, maybe Hillary probably runs even with her on toughness, but she had a nasty, nasty primary. She was a recovering alcoholic, had been sober for 10 years, and all of a sudden her, her primary opponent is attacking her for her you know, supposed drug use and alcohol use and what did you do when and whatever, and they're just completely going after her. We were the biggest financial contributor in the primary race. And at the end of the day, what saved the campaign was that Ann kind of had her own personal come to Jesus and said, I can't let them do this to me. And she turned around and just started attacking her two opponents, and that was the end of them. Uh, 
but it was only because she realized she can't be little Miss Nice Girl um, and let it happen. She had to go out there and compete and be aggressive, and if it meant going negative and uh, telling the people who they really were, that's what she was gonna do. Same thing through the general election. We helped her when she was down in the polls, uh, and at the end of the day, her opponent made a colossal mistake. It was literally the last weekend, uh, and Ann became the governor of Texas, and it was just a phenomenal win. Ann Richards, I, when I got started in politics, I worked at the National Women's Political Caucus, and it was in the late 70s. And it was the beginning of women kind of learning about politics and trying to have some kind of say in the political process. Ann and a whole group of friends were the caucus in Texas. And Ann Richards used to go with her friend and put this exhibit in the back of the station wagon and travel around to the schools to teach the girls in Texas that there were women in the history of Texas. It wasn't just men. And I mean, this is who this woman is. And to the day she died, she would, every election she would call us up and say, okay, who should I go help? Give me my list and I'll go out and do events and do fundraisers and help them. She was the ultimate feminist activist. Only in 1990, Anne and my friends from the National Women's Political Caucus took over the government of the state of Texas. The third tin pole was Anita Hill and the anger that it broke through and it totally changed the landscape for Emily's List and women in government. It did. Um, I, I don't know if you all remember this. I know some of you do because I can hear the murmurs. <laughs> uh, President Bush Sr. appointed Clarence Thomas uh, to fill the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court vacancy. Um, sound familiar if anybody remembers that. And um, so anyway, he did and Anita Hill uh, would t went to the, when they were doing the investigation, told the investigators that he had sexually harassed her when they worked together and, sh and he was her boss. And the Senate Judiciary Committee tried to sweep it under the rug. Now this is my pop quiz. Who is the chair, the Democratic chair? <laughs> no, 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 I'm gonna say it again. You guys are too, you're too eager here. The Democratic chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Joe Biden, yes, who is trying to kind of sweep it under the rug. We don't need to get into this. Until Nina Totenberg broke the story on NPR. And as Craig writes in the book, he said, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. And for days, the country was riveted by this awful hearing in which 14 white men on the Senate Judiciary Committee basically sat on their hands on the Democratic side and didn't defend Anita Hill or uh, attacked her, said awful things, led by, there you go, there's the Pennsylvania hook, Arlen Specter. So um, women who had been dealing, you know, remember the television show Mad Men? I mean, women had been dealing with this sexual harassment in the workplace for years. It was always considered the woman's problem. She had to figure out how to diffuse it or, you know, she'd have all these w ways of dealing with it and whatever, but nobody ever discussed it. Men had a very different concept of what was going on. If they were gonna kind of pat the girl on the fanny and you know, uh, whatever, or chase her into the next room and shut the door, that was totally fine. You know, you boys are just having fun. So there was a very different understanding of appropriate behavior in the workplace. Women were outraged and it was like they took the cork out of the bottle and everybody started talking about their stories about sexual harassment, how they believed and needed because that had happened to uh, them and where were the women on the Judiciary Committee that could explain as a woman that works what it's like out there. And for the first time, a lot of people realized that there were only two out of 100 senators that were women and there were none on the Senate Judiciary Committee. 
So overnight, there was a fire to elect women, particularly to the United States Senate. And it resulted in this burst of energy. Emily's List became the focal point of all that. We were on 60 Minutes and Oh boy, everywhere I went, there were television crews and everything, you know, is this gonna work? Is the election gonna make a difference? At the end of that election, we added four new Democratic women to the United States Senate. Uh, remember I said there were 12 Democratic women in the House in 1988? 1992, we added 20 new Democratic women to the House. It was a sea change of women in politics being represented in the Congress. And for Emily's list, we had 3,000 members after Ann's race, and we had 24,000 members after the, uh, after the 1992 election. That gave us the resources to then go out and do more than just raise money for candidates, but turn into this huge, political organization that does all kinds of things now to help women win. But it all is because of the courage of Anita Hill who stood up and, and you know, told truth to power about what had happened to her and why she didn't think Clarence Thomas should be on the court. A lot of people who pay attention to politics and in this state and across the river in New Jersey are hit by how hard it is for women in this state still for statewide elections mm -hmm. as we watch Katie McGinty and others try to become governor, try to become a senator. And Emily's list, smartly, realize we can't just focus on the United States Congress. We have to focus on coattails down into states, down into house races, down into city councils. Tell us the story of Gwen Moore and what you figured out and why you needed to be doing that. Okay. Well, I'm gonna talk about Gwen Moore as a wonderful example of how it all fits together when you're running for Congress. Uh, and what I mean when I say we're a full service political organization. Gwen is a wonderful African American woman and represented in the Wisconsin State Senate, Milwaukee, and the urban district of Milwaukee. It was a very poor district. Uh, she worked very hard on issues like housing and, and welfare, trying to help her constituents. She is an incredibly determined, wonderful woman, and uh, I'll give you an example of how Gwen Moore acts. The community couldn't get any money for loans, so Gwen said, well, we'll just have to have a credit union, and she went out and started a credit union to make money available for people in the community. So loved in her community. Her congressman announces his retirement, so the seat's opening up. It's a solid Democratic district. It includes her state Senate seat and then a core of, of white um, working class Democrats around the district who are more conservative and of course liberal Democrats in, in and around Milwaukee. So what Gwen has to do is g basically broaden her base from her Senate seat into this broader constituency. In the primary, there is a guy by the name of Matt Flynn who was a trial lawyer, uh, very successful. He had been the former chair of the Wisconsin Democratic Party, uh, and the establishment loved Matt Flynn. And they were convinced he was gonna win. The governor had given him his tacit support. All the governor's guys were working for him. Uh, the most powerful member of the congressional delegation was for him. Uh, he was the front runner. Everybody thought it was a done deal. So the question is, how do you help nice, wonderful, hardworking, brilliant State Senator Gwen Moore win against the front runner and the, and the person that the establishment is behind. So let me read a little tiny bit from the book so you uh, see what Emily does when we go to work. Gwen had been trained by our POP program, but she still had only a vague familiarity with Emily's list. For the most part, she dismissed us as a bunch of rich white ladies. I had heard of Emily's list, but I just knew they weren't gonna help me. I had heard they didn't help black people. But that was precisely where Gwen was wrong. In fact, more than one third of the women we helped elect were women of color. And we were exactly what Gwen needed if she was to expand her base. 
So we immediately assigned Jennifer Palaja, a young staffer with Emily's List, to work with Gwen. At first, Gwen was standoffish. When Jen told her we would support her, she responded, oh, I know, you're the people that are gonna make me swim the English Channel. And when I get to the other side, you're there with a warm chow and a cup of hot chocolate. Well, then Jen told Gwen she was exactly what Emily's List was looking for, a committed pro-choice Democratic woman who would be an excellent member of Congress and wait till she saw what Emily's List could do to help. Gwen was a fascinating candidate. In the state Senate, she had become a powerful voice who had real fire in her belly. She gave startlingly candid speeches on the floor of the State House, using her own life as an unwed mother and someone who had been assaulted as a child as an example. This woman is fantastic, said Jen. She's one of the smartest people I know. She has a photographic memory. She's crafty. Starting a credit union was typical of the way Gwen thinks and acts. We should have this, so she did it. She was terrific on issues that were important to her district, such as food stamps and housing. The problem was that none of these issues brought in political money. I've never seen a candidate who had such a small potential fundraising base, and Gwen was almost proud of it. One of her supporters gave her a box of pennies, and I saw Gwen literally counting the pennies, said Jen. She wanted to make the point that the contribution meant as much to her as all the hours spent raising money on the phone from white liberals. So suddenly you had an understated, mild-mannered young white woman from the Midwest, Jen, trying to tell this unstoppably powerful black woman what she needed to do. It wasn't easy. When it came to debating, Gwen's rhetoric was not exactly geared to the affluent liberal donors she needed. As Gwen put it, her style was street. I know how to argue, I know the facts, but before Emily, my, my style was something like this. To demonstrate, Gwen slowly took off her glasses and looked directly at me as if I were an opponent in a political debate. Kiss my ass, mutter, butter, butter. I'm gonna tell you how it is. <laughs> and then she burst into laughter. Of course, Gwen was putting us on. She was much too smart to blow up her own campaign. But just in case, we made sure Gwen's rhetorical skills were refined somewhat by the time the election was over. <laughs> Amazingly, it all began to work. Emily's List legally couldn't do the actual work of the campaign, fundraising, organizing, and the like, but we had a continuing interest in assessing our races. Of course, a critical part of that process was advising staff, many of whom were new to their jobs on what was working and what wasn't. So we, went sta we sent staffers to monitor Gwen's field operations and her get out the vote process, help her with debate prep and raise money from progressive donors. In the end, we sent so many staffers from Emily's list that Gwen used the name Emily as a prefix for all of them, Emily Jen, Emily Dave, Emily Heather, and so <laughs> forth. I was proud to be known as Emily Ellen. Gwen was a powerful and much-loved candidate, but it is also true that our relationship with her was a terrifically productive political marriage. In the last reporting period before the September primary, Gwen raised $354,000, four times as much as Matt Flynn, and more than 200,000 of that came from our members. In late August, Women Vote went on TV with an issue ad praising Gwen for her work on education. We were at her side every step of the way. When the votes came in on September 15th, Gwen earned her win in what can only be described as a colossal landslide, winning 64% of the vote to just 25% for Flynn. It was hard to remember that just a few months earlier, Flynn had been the prohibitive favorite. So that's what Emily's List does to help our women win. I think that deserves a round of applause. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this for 30 years. Do you find that the thing that these women need today is the same as what they needed 30 years ago or it's changed? What's the key thing that you find women candidates need you to help them with? That's a very good question. I, I think that in many cases, the uh, problems of the political establishment 
have changed, but not always. It comes back every election cycle. We have arguments with the party about primaries. They think they have the rest, the great guy. Uh, we think we have the best candidate in our woman, and we argue it out, and we run against them, and um, many, many times we win in those races. One of the things that's changed in campaigns is the issue of money. When Barbara Mikulski uh, won the Senate race, her total campaign was about one and a half million dollars. Now, house races cost four times that. It is phenomenal, the amount of money in the political system. And with Citizens United, uh, the whole system has been upended. So now you have millions of dollars from outside interest. It's, it's like the, the competition of the billionaires, who's going to elect whom in this election. It's just awful. And one of the things that it does is it makes the campaign, the candidate and the campaign, small pieces of the big election dialogue. So Gwen Moore may decide she wants to talk about creating jobs for the middle class, but some wealthy guy is hammering her on you know, domestic violence legislation or something like that. And it just makes a mess over the strategies of how you run these massive, wealthy, big funded campaigns. So the system now is terrible. And um, I, I think, you know, I hope when the Supreme Court, finally we get our ninth member of the Supreme Court, the court will relook uh, what's going on with Citizens United because it is just absolutely devastating our political system. A couple instances in the book, you have women, both of whom you like and would have supported, mm -hmm. run against you, each, each other in the primary. And that made me think about this time out. Did you stay up at night saying, Elizabeth Warren, please don't run. You had supported <laughs> her. Don't put me in this position of having to pick between you and Hillary. No, it, it's uh, fortunately she did not do that. But it is something uh, we knew from early on that eventually we were going to have more than one woman in the race. and. At the beginning of the 1992 election, before Thomas Hill and all those things are happening, I said to the steering committee, one of the things I think we have to anticipate is we have a lot of House races. It's the post redistricting uh, led, um, election. They're going to be more open seats than usual. And I just bet you we're going to have a primary for the House somewhere where there's more than one woman, and we're going to have to figure out what to do about that. Well, I thought that would be nice and quiet and we could calmly work it out. What ended up happening is in New York in 1992, there was a Senate race and co former Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman and former Congresswoman Geraldine Ferraro were running against each other in a primary with two other men. It was a nightmare come true. Uh, uh, Liz Holtzman was a, a feminist from the old days, a uh, member of the Judiciary Committee during the Nixon impeachment, uh, a real powerful, well-respected member of Congress. And of course, Jerry was on the ticket uh, with Fritz Mondale, the first woman nominated as vice president in a major party and was beloved across the country. So what do we do? We came up with a process uh, that we use now all the time when we're in this situation. The first decision we make is if we don't make a decision on which woman to support, will we lose this rare opportunity to put a woman in office? Um, believe it or not, in when Maria Cantwell ran for the Senate in Washington State, the Democrats had two people in a primary and they were both women. And so we stayed out. We thought, well, the woman's going to win. We'll stay out. We'll work in the general. So once we decide that there's a challenge, a strong male challenger, that we need to take advantage of this opportunity, we, we do a lot of work. We may do our own poll. We look at the campaign plans. We meet with the candidates, their campaign team. We talk to people on the ground. We look at the money they're raising and what they're doing and essentially try to figure out who is the strongest candidate to win the general election. When we do that, we then will come in and pick that candidate to help. And then when we come in, we do everything we can to win that race because the biggest problem we have 
getting women in offices, there just aren't very many opportunities to add newcomers to office. And so uh, we go through it. It is an agonizing process. It's not something we enjoy, but I think it's something we have to do. Uh, and it would be faint-hearted just to pass on the situation because the decision was difficult. Two quick questions before we open it up to the crowd. Are you surprised that a Sarah Palin or someone else hasn't tried to knock off your model for conservative women? Actually, some people have. Um, in 92, one of our members came to me and said, uh, I'd like to start something for Republican women like Emily's List. Do you mind? And I thought, you know, I knew a lot of wonderful, moderate Republican women uh, when I was at the National Women's Political Caucus. Ronald Reagan came in in the 80s. The Republicans, conservatives started taking over the party and pushed all those women out. And so, you know, I'd be happy to give you any advice you want and uh, did for many years. We'd meet periodically and it was called Wish List. Uh, it had a terrible time in the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party got worse and worse about accepting moderate women uh, in their ranks. And so they had a terrible time getting women through their primaries. When you look at the Congress right now and you see all these women, you think, gee, what a change and it's just great. Well, one of the things that shocked me, actually me, shocked me writing the book, was how much of that progress that we see is on the Democratic side. When we began Emily's List doing house races in 88, there were 12 Democratic women and 11 Republican women. So we were both about 5% of our party's members of Congress. Today, when you, when you look at the percentages, women are about a third of the Democrats in Congress. I mean, a huge sea change. The Republicans have gone from 5% to 9%. So there are nine m Republican men in Congress for every one woman. There are hardly any women in the room. It is shocking that after 30 years, they've made no progress putting women into office. I think it's one of the reasons that their policies on women are so out of touch with what's going on with women's lives. They certainly could use more women in there explaining biology to them. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and frankly, I think it's outrageous, and I hope that Republican conservative women find a way to do something about that. Every cycle now, there's little talk about it, and I haven't seen many results, but I think the country would be better off, even though I wouldn't agree with them on probably on a lot of issues, if they had more women on the Republican side, just like we do. I'm sure you've seen, I finally stopped and watched it today, the ad about the things that Donald Trump has said about women. Uh -huh. And right now, they're arguing about each other's wives, he and Ted Cruz, and some <laughs> of the things that are being said. Um, and Franklin Ford, if you haven't seen it, has a piece up on Slate right now talking about misogyny mm. being a key strain in Article Trump's history. Article is wonderful. You should go find that. Donald, why does Donald hate? Donald Trump hates women. It's, it's fascinating as he puts Fabulous it all together. Article. We were talking about Anita Hill and the groundswell. You put all that together, and you wonder why in the Republican Party there's not a rearing up of women saying no, no. Well, part of it is that the Republican, that most women, I mean, the Democrats take the lion's share of women right now. They're not in the Republican Party. Uh, you have to remember Trump, when he's winning these primaries and these caucuses, is still getting like a third of the vote, you know, 40% of the vote. He has a very active base of angry white men, basically. Um, and some women. I mean, we see them on the television. I'm not saying there aren't women. But the polling on women's reaction, and I mean Democratic women, Republican women, independent women to Donald Trump is unbelievably negative feelings about him. I think if this election keeps going like this, Hillary will be the nominee and we will have the biggest gender gap we have ever seen in politics because women cannot stand, they understand who that man is, they understand that this is what they've been fighting and what they can't stand about, you know, the worst aspects of sexism. And, uh, and it's not only what they say, what he says about women, it's how he treats everybody. It's the, the constant attacks, the 
uh, unreasonable way of dealing with anybody. Um, you know, they just don't like him at all. And then you put on top of that Hillary's clear interest in issues that are important to women and families that have, and, and her demonstration of that over her entire life. And uh, women are going to make the difference for Hillary. And I think women voters are going to make Hillary Clinton the first woman president of the United States. What is Emily's list position on the uh, uh, Senate race in Pennsylvania? Oh, we are very excited about Katie McGinty. We think she is a terrific woman. Um, this is, I want to put this race in context because you're going to be hearing a lot about it. And it's going to get a lot of national attention. Uh, one of the things, well, Mitch McConnell, I don't even have to make the case. Mitch McConnell made the case uh, about why it's important for Democrats to take back control of the Senate when he said he wouldn't even consider President Obama's uh, nominee to the Supreme Court. So who is in control of the Senate is a is up in the air in this election. We have only four seats difference between us. They have a host of Republican senators up. And we have five women that we are supporting against Republican senators that I think have a very good chance of taking back the seat. Katie McGinty, I think, is that candidate here in Pennsylvania. She uh, has spent her life working on issues important to women and, and children. Uh, on the environment. She's had a lot of policy experience in the Clinton administration and working for two governors here in Pennsylvania. Uh, and as the ninth child of 10 kids, she's got to be tough enough to deal with politics. So uh, we're pretty excited about Katie. Are there any circumstances in which Emily's List would support a male candidate, one who had either a, quote, better record than the woman opponent or a better history of playing nicely with other legislators. <laughs> no, I'm getting things done. I don't mean to belittle yeah, right. it. I'm asking. No. <laughs> but let me tell you, um, uh, you know, we're still only 18% of the Congress. and. If you believe, as I do, that our country functions as a representative democracy and when we represent lots of different people, we come up with better policies, uh, we think that 18% is not right. It is uh, an issue of diversity. It hurts my progressive values. And so we are doing everything we can to change that. But I also want to add that we do a lot of work with women voters. It's one of the pieces that came out of this post uh, Anita Hill period of time. And we now uh, spend millions of dollars motivating women to go to the polls and having conversations with them about issues that will convince them to vote for Democratic candidates. When we do that, we are helping all the Democrats on the ticket because those women go in and we may say, go in and vote for Hillary Clinton, but they don't just turn around and walk out. Then they start going all the way down the ballot. So in 2008, when President Obama was running for re-election, uh, running for election, uh, we were interested in two Senate races, Jeannie Shaheen in New Hampshire and Kay Hagan in North Carolina. Those were also key target states for the Obama campaign. And so we had a conversation with them. We told them we were going we to mobilize women voters. And we were quite mindful of the fact that that was going to help President Obama win those two critical states. So yes, we help men. But our um, goal is to elect women. And we would never, I ever, endorse a man over a woman candidate. Hi, Ellen. <laughs> Can you tell the audience about the POP program, about what you do with state legislatures? with city of elected officials, and specifically candidates locally who you have helped okay. and trained. OK. Um, in about 2000 and 2002, Emily's List launched what we call the Political Opportunity Program. Uh, unfortunately, became known as the POP Program. I don't know if that's the best name we ever came up with. But at any rate, we're helping women pop up all over the place, I guess. 
Uh, and what we do is we go in and we recruit and train women and encourage them to run for office. And are, are our two staffers here? Are you here? Stand up so we can see you. These are two women that work for us. And you are doing training in Pennsylvania now, right? So thank you for doing that. It's great work. Uh, and it's wonderful for us because not only does it get women. I'll, I'll go back to my Gwen Moore story. This is a fun, fun story. Gwen was in the state senate, and we had been working in Wisconsin for a couple of years and, and training people. As I mentioned in the beginning, we had trained her to run for a state senate race. So she runs. She's going to vacate her state senate race. So we go to the woman that had taken over her assembly race and said, we think you should run for Gwen State Senate seat. She said, you do? We said, yeah, we'll show you what to do. We'll help you work through this. But you have one other job. And she said, what's that? Well, you have to go find a woman to run for the assembly seat. So she went and recruited another woman to run for the assembly seat. So now we have Gwen for Congress. Then we have another woman for the state senate, another woman running for the assembly seat. They all won. We called it our trifecta. <laughs> so uh, that's what we're trying to do is bring women in at all levels. First of all, thank you for coming to Philadelphia. I'm super excited to hear you speak. Oh, Back in you. college, I actually wrote my senior thesis on challenges to the female presidency. And obviously, Emily's List was a huge part of that narrative. So. Really excited about the work you're doing. Did you conclude one could win? I focused on campaign finance and um, the media rhetoric, and it aligns with what you were saying as far as like media. Definitely, women have to be um, aggressive almost in calling out the negative biases. And mm -hmm. as far as campaign finance, em uh, early money is like you. So. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. So my question actually was. How do you rationalize that Hillary Clinton or liberal, liberal women running for um, political office are better advocates for women in general to conservative women? How do I explain to conservative women that, I'm going to make sure I understand yeah, your question. Yeah, how do you explain to conservative women that liberal women like Hillary Clinton's better than the alternative, for example, in this election? Um, I probably, believe it or not, would not be talking to that group of women. <laughs> and, I, and I mean this in all seriousness, because we are good marketing people and good strategists. And so the people that we are going to go to and target are the people that are swing voters that we can move over from the Republican side. Now, if Donald Trump keeps, these up, keeps this up, maybe conservative women are some people we can appeal to. <laughs> but um, normally, we do not have conversations with conservative women. We go to independent women and try to persuade them because they're the most likely. We never have enough money. We are not the Koch brothers. And so even though we raised and contributed in the last election $50 million to candidates, uh, we don't have a, a penny to lose. So in, we try to be start, uh, smart and strategic, just as we do with everything else, and uh, target those women where we're going to get the most bang for our buck. What do you say to those women about two arguments we see emerging? Oh, her voice. She doesn't smile. <laughs> she sounds like my first ex-wife. The other one is you can't trust her. She's a Clinton. You never know what will pop out. Yeah. So what do you say to independents who say, oh, I don't know? Boy, those are two different kinds. So let me, let me give you a more complicated answer. The first on the gender stuff. When we started doing house races back in the, actually when I was at the caucus in, in the 80s, and a woman would run for office, voters had no idea what that would be. Who's ever heard of a woman running for a political office? They had no reference points. They, you know, they, they, what would that, what would she look like? Could she do that job? What would it, what would happen if she won? You know, could she serve in office? It was, it was very unclear. And so there was a lot of resorting to gender stereotypes. And in those days, women running for the house would be peppered by 
Who's buying the groceries? What does your husband think about this? Do you really think you can understand a budget? You know, a lot of gender stuff. As we elected more and more women, and actually even women that did good, good jobs running and may not even have won, uh, voters began to be more comfortable with a woman in that world doing those kinds of things. So they stopped the gender stuff. Now our House candidates don't get any questions about grocery shopping unless they're talking about the price of food. So, but what happens is when you get to the next level, it all comes back again. So when Nancy Pelosi was um, elected the Speaker of the House, the first woman Speaker, all of a sudden there are all these stories on what does she look like and what is she wearing and what is her jewelry and, and questions like, are you tough enough to deal with George Bush? Um, are you gonna be smart enough to get all the Democrats to come together and stay together? Well, Nancy is tough and brilliant and strategic but you know, it's this gender doubt, could a woman really do this job? Hillary runs in 2008. It was disgusting, the, the conversation in the media. Uh, you know, her voice, her ankles, her this, her that, the nutcrackers and the, and, you know, you could buy in the airport that looked like Hillary. I mean, it was just awful. Uh, remember, iron my shirt, I mean, that was a good one. Um, now I think we, that has dissipated a little bit. We haven't seen quite as much of that, but it's still there. And when there was this whole thing about whether Hillary shouts, you know, is she shouting too much, her voice is terrible, I thought it was a joke at first. I mean, to me, Bernie Sanders is always shouting. I, <laughs> I was like, what? Hillary doesn't shout, he shouts. What are you talking about? But it's a gender perception. People see and hear women differently. Uh, and I, you know, I think so far it's been pretty good. I think if Donald Trump's a nominee, he's gonna push that button, just as he has with race and all these divisive issues that he's doing. And I'm afraid it's gonna be really nasty, but I think men and women uh, are smarter now and they're not gonna stand for it. And he's gonna pay the price for it just as he already is, as women watch him deal with Megyn Kelly and obsess about women's appearance and clearly go after any woman that asks him a tough question. So, uh, you know, I think that's the, the gender issue. In terms of the trust issue, you know, there has been, uh, for lack of a better term, a right-wing conspiracy that has invested millions of dollars in basically trying to tell you you should not trust the Clintons. It started before they even took office after the, uh, they won the presidential election. And you remember there were all these things in the Clinton administration about the Whitewater investment and Travelgate and Vince Foster's death and you know, did Hillary kill him and you know, all this stuff and <laughs> they moved his body, I mean, just all these outrageous things that were just this drumbeat, white water, special prosecutors, $50 million investigation. At the end of the day, there was nothing there in any of those issues. But there's this sort of residual worry that maybe you can't trust the Clintons. And so it makes me angry when I hear this drumbeat of you can't trust Hillary. Why not? We have seen that woman operate for 30 years. She has not done anything wrong in any of these issues like emails and Benghazi and all this nonsense. It is the Republicans and we saw it with Benghazi, it was blatant trying to use issues to make you distrust Hillary Clinton because they're scared to death she's gonna win this election and be the next president. I'm a little interested in about your thoughts of the power of women in politics in other nations than our nations, England, Germany, mm -hmm. and so forth. You know, it depends, and in a lot of the parliamentary systems, there's a higher percentage of women in office um, in England, for example. Uh, by the way, in 92, uh, a woman named Barbara Follett, who is married to the author Ken Follett, 
came and visited us and went back and started Emily's List UK and helped take back government for labor with, uh, in, in the next election. So uh, I always got a big kick out of that. And there's another group in uh, Australia and a couple of other places. Uh, it's a very different dynamic in a parliamentary system. It, the role of the party is very different. The, what the candidates do in the election are very different. And so, uh, you know, it's hard to compare them, but it's great to see women leading, and uh, it's even greater to see it here at home for me. Hi. <clears throat> We'd like to hear about the person behind Emily's List. Uh, what is it? Tell us about your background, and have you ever considered running for office? <laughs> and who is that, Emily, anyway? Um, <laughs> Well, and, and I go through some of this in the book. I grew up not all that far from here in Montclair, New Jersey, in a Republican family. Uh, my mother uh, was, uh, from her generation, believed that when you married, you stopped working and you stayed home and you took care of the kids. But my mother was a very active, committed, uh, member of the community and worked in all kinds of volunteer jobs, uh, ending up in leadership positions, uh, uh, head of the uh, Junior League, the United Way, the Mental Health Association, and so really gave me a sense that women could lead and that we had a responsibility to give back to the community. So those values, um, I always think like as a child of the 60s, I did the 60s version of what my mother did in the 50s and went into the workforce and uh, continued the work to try to make a difference and, and give back to the community, only in my case do it through uh, either my personal philanthropy or through Emily's List. Once again, Ellen, thanks, thanks for being here. That's great to have you. Um, you. Bernie Sanders has been bringing out an awful lot of young people, young women, to, um, to the election. What I worry about is that when Hillary becomes the candidate, what will happen with these people who have been coming out for Sanders? Will she be able to bring them out to vote mm -hmm. for her? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's anything that Emily's List is doing with, as you say, you work with voters, uh, with um, people in this particular age group. Um, I have to say, I was in New Hampshire campaigning for Hillary, and the reporters were asking me so much about millennial women. Uh, after a few days, I thought of them as those damn millennial women. I <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, I'm pretty excited that the millennials are, are getting involved in politics, and uh, good for Bernie, because I graduated, actually so did Hillary, in 1969 at the height of the anti-war movement, uh, civil rights, re uh, educational unrest. I mean, it was a, an incredible time. And my first political act, actually, was to come to Philadelphia to door knock for Gene McCarthy, Senator Gene McCarthy, who was the anti-war candidate. I went to a Simon and Garfunkel concert. It was great fun. <laughs> so um, that I felt when I was in college that my generation was going to change the world. That we had different views of things. We there were lots of us. We were going to bring peace. We were going to end this civil rights in inequality and, and end poverty. And I was committed to that. And just as Hillary Clinton was, too. Same thing, went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, became a lifelong um, uh, uh, commitment to trying to make government work to help people in their lives. And that's what I have tried to do, too, in my way. So I see these millennial women and, I, and men, and I think, good for them. I, you know, I hope they're going to door knock for Bernie just like I did for Clean Jean. And I hope they get excited and they learn skills and they will come out and um, continue this work for years and years to come. In terms of the election, we have uh, the great unifier on the other side and that is Donald Trump. <laughs> so, uh, 
<laughs> if I ever worry that they're not going to come out, we've got a long way to go of listening to Donald. Uh, I think millennials, and the polling actually shows this, uh, they will come and support Hillary overwhelmingly uh, over Donald Trump. And I do think they'll vote, and I think they're going to be horrified by this campaign. And so uh, good for that energy, because some of those young folks are going to be on the ground helping us in November. Thank you for thank coming you. out. And this has been fun. Thank you very much. <laughs>